took me three or four times of just sitting in the back and, oh no, I don't want to speak. Oh no, no, no. Uh, my favorite sandwich is... This is the District 7 Podcast for 2023-2024. My name is Ray Miller, and today I am interviewing our past District 7 PRM and a whole bunch of other things that we're going to be talking about, Stefana Johnson. Hello, Stefana. How are you today? Hi. Did I pronounce your name here. right? Perfect. Perfect. It's always a question. I have a I have a number of questions. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago so that I could outline what we were going to be talking about. And I always want to get to know about the people that I'm interviewing just a little bit to think about how they're thinking, how they get involved in Toastmasters. And I always have one first question, which is not Toastmasters related at all. So I'm really interested in your answer to this question. Stefano, what is the best sandwich? Mm. Uh, my favorite sandwich is a sprouted cream cheese, cucumber on raisin bread. It's amazing. Say that again, sprouted. <laughs> okay, so you take raisin bread, ideally good raisin bread, and then some cream cheese, and then you put sliced cucumber on there. And then sprouts. So I will use, often I'll just use alfalfa sprouts, but you can, sunflower sprouts are fabulous. It's so good. I was really into sprouting for a while. And so um, I, I made, um, yes, anyway, it's delicious. That is probably <laughs> the most interesting qu answer to that question that I've had since I started asking it. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to write that down. And, and 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 do that sandwich and give that one a try because that sounds mm -hmm. really good. It's so good. But leading into my Toastmastery type questions, can you remember when you joined Toastmasters and why you joined in the first place? I remember exactly. It was in 2012. I had just moved to Portland, Oregon from Austin, Texas with my two little boys. I was feeling alone and scared, but I really wanted to, I had something inside of me that needed to be shared through the spoken word. I didn't know all the details, but I knew that. And the Toastmasters had always been in the back of my mind. I'm not sure where I first heard about it. I, you know, you just somehow we all hear about it. I found a local club at the time it was called Rose City. It is now, or I think it was Rose City, something like that. It's now Dick Moser. And I walked in as a visitor in 2012, May, and met Dick Moser, who is to this day one of the most wonderful, kind, caring gentlemen that I've ever known. And he became my mentor. And that club, it took me three or four times of just sitting in the back and, oh, no, I don't want to speak. Oh, no, no, no. I, you know, it should be, okay. But they would ask you, would you like to speak? And so it took me, it took me a, a couple of weeks. And with Dick being incredibly supportive and the whole, everyone there, um, I joined. And I would say the rest is history for the most part, but that's, that's the why and that's the when and how. I think we're going to explore a bit of that rest of history here <laughs> going forward, but I think I've, I've got it written down in my notes here that I need to speak to Dick Moser because it's always about. Well, I will tell out. you, Dick Moser passed a few years ago oh. and the club was renamed after in honor of him which is a great honor. And he is, uh, he, he was uh, completely the, 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 the whole essence of that club, just genuine, connected, kind, fun. He was professional. He was, 
he was retired at the time when I met him. He was also an Aikido black belt instructor. And so I learned he recommended an Aikido studio place. So he was my kind of lifeline and, and mentored even just coming here into Portland from another state. And yeah, it was his, wow. his legacy is, is amazing. Legacy is important. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like his legacy is going to continue for a long time. Yes. I know right at the, the, the beginning, one of the first notes that I had that we talked about is that you were in Toastmasters for a while, and then you left for a short period of time before coming back. Did you, uh, like, I don't want to ask why why you left. I'm I'm more interested in the reason you returned. Was it different than the reason you joined? Did it feel different when you came back? Oh, uh, it's a hundred percent different. So I'll tell you, uh, because I was a single mom and I chose to homeschool my children. That and and also working running a business, I did not have the time or energy for Toastmasters at all. And I, I since then moved to Camas or Vancouver, Washington. And so I wasn't there at Rose City and I wasn't commuting back and forth. So it was, it was not workable for me to stay, uh, stay with the club and, and continue doing that. I was very active at the time. I also did roles. I was in contests. I was, for the first few years, I was very active. And then for that about, I would say almost six years, period of time, I did not do Toastmasters because I was full-time mom, full-time homeschooling, full-time running a business. And there just was not enough for me to do any of that. Now, when I came back, I specifically sought Toastmasters for the youth leadership program because my children were of an age that I wanted them to start speaking. And I was thinking of trying to start a gavel club or what that would take. And so I reached out to clubs in my area. I, I called or emailed every club that I could get a hold of, I think five or six clubs. And I didn't really hear back from, uh, there was a short time that I did join a, another club that was in person prior to COVID. And that was in Vancouver. And then I came back in 2021. And that is what I was seeking really to to get the Toastmasters skills for my children, for my two sons. And in doing that, it took me a year of getting back into Toastmasters, going through the pathways because I was not familiar with that at all. And my, I still have all of my books and, and my books, I love them. I still love going through them. So there was there was definitely a learning curve uh, shifting to online. And I'm not a fan of doing everything online, but we all embrace it. Right. So it took some time. Then finally I was able to, I, my club sponsored our youth leadership and I started the youth leadership. That was actually the next, next block of uh, discussion that I had lined up was to talk about le youth leadership mm -hmm. and to and and I guess that explains how you got involved in youth uh, youth leadership. One question I have is when you finally connected into the youth leadership program, do you remember that first session? Of youth, youth leadership? leadership? Yeah. <laughs> of course. Of the, course. And, and how, what would you like to know? <laughs> like, how did it feel? The mm. like, because I, I I imagine you'd been dreaming about it or thinking about it leading into it. Yes. But it how did that first session feel? Right. There's there's a lot that goes into the youth leadership. First of all, you have to promote it and get invite people. You know, you you don't just snap your fingers and then people show up. I had two boys, my my son. So that's two people. You want at least five in your youth leadership, right? So that was a process. It took me some time to. I was searching for a location for it. I, there were logistics that I had to work through. And finally, I just decided, oh, because I couldn't find places that were affordable. I would have to rent a room, all this nonsense that seemed like, why do I have to go through all this? I just want to, I just want to do it. 
Um, so finally I just said, I'm doing it in my living room and I'm setting the times. And if people want to come great, if they don't, that's okay too. Uh, my club, we, we invested in a kit. The youth leadership kit is completely affordable. It's all there for you. It's right on Toastmasters international website and, uh, you don't have to reinvent anything. So once I knew that and I felt, okay, I'm going to do this, rip off that band-aid. <laughs> this was uh, the process. So I had six people actually sign up. Two of them were my sons. I ran it. My club sponsored it. It was in my home. The first day, so interesting because I had Jim Robeson had a student who was in the public school system who wanted to join and thought, okay, that's great. And so I adjusted the time a bit so that he could actually come after school. So he drove from two cities down, two cities away, all the way over to my house to, to do this. And to this day, I still get cards that they loved it. They, they loved being a part of it. And in fact, he went on to, uh, go into public speaking in order to get a scholarship and I was privileged to mentor him. So that's on us on an aside, but it led, it was because of le youth leadership and specifically the setup that whomever put the youth leadership program together did an amazing job. Do not change a thing. Don't make it a pathways. May, it needs to be, especially now youth, need to be in person. They need to be seen, felt, heard. It needs to be tactile. We, I do not believe youth leadership would be a valuable or good use of anyone's time done virtually. That's my opinion. So in doing that, that first session, was I scared? Yes, absolutely. Did I... <laughs> my sons said to me at the end because they were excited i said guys just just one if you just show up to one check it out if you absolutely hate it you don't have to continue and of course at the end because it's so at the at the end of the first one and and from the perspective that i have which is i just want to empower our youth and, and inspire them and light their fire. I don't, we don't need to change them. We don't need to do anything and just no judgment. And if they know that they're in a safe space to be able to speak and to share their voice, whatever that is, what a gift. So that's what I went into it doing on that first day. And of course they all showed up. They never missed any, they were all, I mean, it was phenomenal. And that was for, that was six people of six young men and women and my heart is so full from that and then we have another we did a second one now we're in our third one we just started our first week last week it's amazing because we know the blossoming that happens as a result of the youth leadership it's so rewarding now that you're just in year three, I mean, I had a question here because I didn't want you to name names about specific participants in the youth leadership program. But I, after we talked before, the thing that stuck in my mind is, can you think of one of the members from last year or the year before where being in the program changed their life in a way that might not have happened otherwise, like where it made that, where it made that specific difference for them? Oh, I absolutely can. And I can tell you the parents that in the one that we did in the fall, the parents came up afterwards and said, and, and we were running it free. It's, it's not, you don't charge for it. Toastmasters, we, it's a nonprofit. We don't charge for it at all. And so I was able to get us into a homeschool co-op where they normally charge for classes, for the homeschool classes. And I offered it and opened it up and we had 18 people sign up. And um, the first day, some of them were so nervous and there were a couple people that didn't come back. 
because, oh my gosh, I actually have to speak. I actually have to speak out loud. I got what? Like, yes, this is what this is about. Right. And they knew that, but, uh, and the parents, I think were probably encouraging some of them because they want them to get out of their shell, et cetera. Well, there were two that signed up late, two brothers and the mom heard about it and said, can we still sign up? And so she signed up these two boys and it's, it still takes my breath away to know what happened to this young man who essentially it's because of the leadership portion. There is a significant chairmanship uh, aspect to youth leadership, right? It's, it's setting it up. There's parliamentary procedure. You nominate a president, vice president, sergeant in arms, and a secretary, and they are running the club. And once they are voted in, that's, they are running that. They're running it. I, as a coordinator, I'm just watching and observing and supporting. And what happened with those that took on the leadership roles? And they really stepped into that. And then they applied what's just speaking. And I, the mom said, he, he just transformed. He's, he was naturally outgoing, but he now had structure and focus and could really, it's so exciting. And so the, um, the results are just, oh my gosh, it's just phenomenal. In eight weeks, eight weeks. On the ninth week, we usually do a finale. And on this last, the last one in the fall, the pit, we invited all the parents and the parents were so excited. Like, how can I do this? We want to do more of this. We wanted the, the youth chose to do a debate, which is always fun, right? So it's, it's kind of like table topics, but they set it up as a debate and it was so much fun. So much fun. <laughs> I did yeah. a table topic session back in my old home club years ago uh, that was set up as Oxford style questions, debate questions. So I'd give them up and then I give them their question and I, and I would give them the, the statement that they were to defend specifically. Mm. <laughs> it didn't matter whether they That's agreed great. with it or not. They had to defend this particular perspective. It was a, it was an interesting experiment. I don't know. I never did ended up doing it again, mm. but I have all, I've often thought about it when I, when I come back and think about opposing, opposing arguments and opposing discussions and the, and the importance of being able to have one respectfully. Yes. But that's the, the, yes. The thing I always say about Toastmasters, it is an it is an inexpensive place where the risk of failure is high and the cost of failure is really low. You can just fail and improve because there's only two things I can do in life. I can win or I can learn. That's right. That's exactly right. That's what we say. Which which just leads to my next batch of of, of thoughts and questions that I wanted to pin you down, get your thoughts on was on, you know, leadership awards and actually leaning into those being recognized for them. You, you received the, the, the district seven, it's a unique award. We don't have one up here in district 96, but the spirit award, mm -hmm. tell me, tell me about that. How did you find out about the, <laughs> uh, uh, about the award you got what is it what did it mean when you got told about it well unfortunately i wasn't able to make it to our mm -hmm. annual awards so i didn't know and i found out about it two ways first i got a package in the mail and there was this trophy I was like what's this and then fred sent me a message and said uh, Fred, the, P uh, the current PR manager for District 7, sent me a message and said, would you like to be on our podcast or something and interview about Spirit Awards? And we want you to, we want you to be on the podcast or something about this. I'm like, I don't, I'm not a spirit. I, I didn't know where I'm not sure what you're talking about. It's like, yes, you won. I'm like, what? Oh, no, I didn't know. I didn't acknowledge. I didn't. So that's how I found out. And um <laughs> I'll pay better attention next time. <laughs> but 
it, you know, I, that's not something that's in my radar. It's not, I, I don't do what I do for accolades or awards, although it's very nice. And it definitely, um, it's, it's definitely, I know it's valuable for many people and they love to get rewards and, and trophies and things like that. Uh, that's not, that's not what I am. That's not what I need. So just say that. But I do, I, uh, it's more like now I honor and I want to do more and help. And because did I really earn it and deserve it? And I know that's that whole thing, but um, yeah, that's just, anyway, it's nice. It's on my fireplace mantle and I love it. <laughs> I'm sitting here in front of my computer, looking up at the uh, district Toastmaster of the year award I got a couple of years ago, mm. and I have similar feelings about it. And and yeah. that was a, an online award, but at the same time, it, it brought up a lot of my, uh, uh, what do we call it? Imposter syndrome. Because I mm. felt like all of the work that I did leading up to getting Toastmasters of the Year, like I said, I or like like you mentioned, I didn't do any of that work with the anticipation of getting an award or a, a reward. Mm -hmm. And getting the reward actually made me feel like all of the work that I'd done, it was never as good as I wanted it to be. So I yeah. felt it that kind of made me. But then after talking to you, actually, I realized. Uh, maybe yeah, even before I realized the reason I got the award wasn't really for me. It was for everybody else to recognize the work that I'd done. And I think and, that's valuable. I, th I, think, I think that's, that's truly so valuable. Important. Yeah. yeah. So important. But uh, what was your most powerful takeaway when you received your award? If you were to put it into a single line. I, I will tell you this. Because I have... Uh, a very special, I'll say this, in my heart, Lori Anderson is one of my favorite Toastmasters. And I stayed on as the PRM for a second term, one, knowing she was going to be the district director. And being able to work with someone like that, she is incredibly generous and caring and supportive and calm and an amazing leader. And to be able to work with her, to be able to uh, be so close to her in that in incredible leadership role. And she, she was just so amazing to watch and to learn from that for me, that's the spirit. I mean, to every time I look at it, I see her spirit that it's the sense of really being so genuine and helpful without any, there, there's just, there's just this subtle grace to who she is. And so for me, I look at it as that she gave that to me and, and I do feel bad that I didn't, I wasn't able to show up. I, I uh, was working at the time. So I felt like, Oh, you know, that's important. And I didn't, I didn't value that. And so that's my, that's on me that, but yes, the spirit award and that it was from Lori is really important to me. I, did I answer important... your question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think you answered my question and any any number of follow-up questions I might have had speaking about the Spirit Awards and stuff like that. So I think the takeaway on that is for anybody else who might watch this or listen to this is when you get an award, remember that it's not just for you. Yes. <laughs> the the, ne the next thing I wanted to talk about you because uh, talk about you I'm going to say this again. The <laughs> next thing that I wanted to talk about here is because this podcast, this interview is tied in and was initiated by Podmasters, which is this new club that is that meets a couple of times a month and is helping to create Toastmasters and other pod like turn Toastmasters into podcasters to en engage with this medium. And I have a, a few questions that I've written down about your podcasters because I see you are a you are a podcast host. You have 
two podcasts that you've had one which was what was your first podcast called finding joy beyond trauma yes and your current podcast is called lead stronger longer yes i wrote both of those down and 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 mm -hmm. i wanted you to say them specifically because those are your podcasts mm -hmm. tell me about who you imagine as the audience for your current podcast what is it your what is what is your um inspiration behind that the this current podcast well, it's about leading yourself personally and professionally, but purposefully. And that means what's my inspiration and what I really hope that those that listen and share my podcast know that we as individuals must lead ourselves first. And in order to do that, we have to step out of this idea that someone else knows our best answer. So that's a really important piece of why I'm doing it. I have a book, Lead Stronger Longer, as well. And it goes along with this. Uh, originally, it was 52 high performance habits, basic habits, right? I think we've gotten into bad habits, especially, I mean, just generally, I can look at it and go 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. We all get into bad habits of, we talked a little bit about it just now in, in, this, in this conversation, in that we... Uh, diminish our gifts. We lessen our contribution and we allow for this idea of this imposter syndrome, which is false. That's, that's, that is only where we are not being truthful with ourselves. And so this is what I want to bring and do bring on a weekly basis to my podcast, Lead Stronger Longer, that inspiration motivation, my experience, tools, tactics, uh, anything that I can share. And then I interview leaders and they share their stories and give us some takeaways. It's been incredibly wonderful and I will continue it. If you would imagine a dream guest to interview on your podcast, who who would it be? Do you, do you have one like a, a a shining star that you would want to reach to to talk to? Like in my uh, mind, I I think Simon Sinek, but uh, is uh, eh. yeah. no. Um, to me, he's bubblegum. <laughs> it's like yes. high school bubblegum. I you know he's lovely, but that's not where I'm looking. Uh, I there would be people definitely. Um, I'm very interested in the classics. Uh, if I could have Ralph Waldo Emerson, oh. Oh, if I could just, right. Th these are, that's where I would love to, to look for. I'd have, um, I'd have Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. I would, th I have a top 20 that I send out, but here's the truth. I believe, you know, I have a faith. I, I'm faith-based. I believe there's a higher power. And we, to, to trust in that higher power is very important. And so I trust that those who, those voices that need to be heard and shared, and that my venue is a way for them to share their voice, that they will, we will find a path. And that's what I believe. So it's a little different than, oh, who's that person up there? Because literally it could be tomorrow, someone who just crossed my path and maybe no one knows them, but they say something that transforms one person's perspective, 
that they aren't enough or they can't or they shouldn't to something that, oh, I must, I must, because we must lead ourselves first and we must be who we are here to be. That's the only reason this imposter syndrome and then all the other names that get labeled on it come up is because we're not living authentically. And authentically, that word has been has been overused and un misunderstood, but it's true, true knowing of yourself and being able to come from that place and express what is true. Something to meditate on for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, I think the, the follow-up questions that I have regarding your podcast, because Really, I can direct people to your podcast so to learn about it. But for the podcasters club, the podmasters club, who is who they're looking to work on on how they would how they would produce their own their own ideas and discussions. I want to talk a little bit about the the planning and everything that goes behind your podcast. Can you share? What your what your process is for planning each episode like i'm thinking in terms of how far ahead are you planning are you like one week two week three weeks four weeks ahead a month ahead do you have what is that plan no like? no no <laughs> i don't want to say that my podcast is an afterthought because it is not it is definitely something that I think about. And I am at the stage now in my life and experiences that I love to be inspired in the moment. And I work very hard to be fully present to my life and trust. So I do not plan at all. Do I schedule things when I have a guest? Absolutely. Now I have, I have specific prepared questions. So when I'm interviewing someone, they already know the questions. We're going to be maybe 20, 25 minutes. Would I love to spend more time with them? Yes. But that's about that sweet spot for most podcasts, from what I understand. And then I'll, I'll do more and then I can do less if I want to put it on LinkedIn and they only go to 10 minutes, these kinds of things. But I do not at this stage. And with my Finding Joy Beyond Trauma, I will tell you, I was going live on blog talk radio every single morning at 5.30 in the morning because I so wanted to communicate what was in my heart. And in fact, on my podcast, I interviewed a couple of district uh, directors at the time. So I, I went live hundreds of days, hundreds and hundreds, and I did it more so to practice being able to go live and to be able to speak and to share what was going on and to tap into uh, uh, my higher self and uh, my trusting in a higher place that would express what needed to come through especially around when you start talking about trauma and different levels of trauma and experiences that can be so buried. And, and I just thought, okay, I, I have to communicate. I have to express this who, and, and I'll let it go out. It was on blog talk radio. And then I would share it on my, um, I would do a video. So the blog talk radio was just a mic, just sound. Then it would go video to my YouTube channel and I would just share. And I had people come to my door six months, 10 months, a couple of years later through of saying, I heard all your podcasts and they would say, you were talking to me. And I never planned a single one of them. I just committed to waking up pushing play, pushing record, and beginning and speaking from my heart. There you have it. I mean, that's just how I did mine. I know I know there's lots of ways to do it. You have to find your right way. 
I think that's the that's the important lesson. There's no one right way. There's only your way. Your way is the way that it works for you. And the way that works for you might work for somebody else. So that's a great message to carry forward as well. Do you have anybody who's in the background helping you uh, with your production, like editing, audio editing, thumbnail, <laughs> anything like that? I wish. That? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't edit. Uh, once I push record, that's it. So if I flub up, I flub up. It's live. Sometimes I'll stream it. Uh, I stopped streaming. I just record it now. So if there's uh, something that happens, I will. And I let my client, I let the guests know we're live. It's totally fine. We're having a conversation. There's no pressure. We don't have to be perfect. You already are whole and perfect. That's the true meaning of perfection anyway, is that you are whole. And I believe that you are. So it's all good. It's all good. And that's so much more enjoyable for me, as well as my guests. So where where can you mentioned a couple of places already? You've got LinkedIn and YouTube. Um, how many places do you publish your your podcast? Do you publish an audio version as well that can be found on Spotify or anything like That's that? That's my goal soon. I really wanted to have a certain amount in the can, as they say, mm. before I pushed the go on that, on iTunes and all of that. And I, uh, that's above my pay grade <laughs> since <laughs> I'm volunteering for this. Yeah. But at some point, I'm sure I'll figure it out if that's, if that's the next step for it. But yes, right now it's all on video, YouTube, LinkedIn. And then I share that to LinkedIn and my blog and, and then I have the MP3s and when they're ready, I'll load them. And I do my best to have a good microphone for me and then ask my clients or I'll raise the sound, but yeah, not microphones, overly complicated. microphones are a, are a passion project for me. I've got a condenser microphone that's kind of sitting in front of me and everybody says it sounds really good. But there's all kinds of microphones that you can use. I've also got a Blue Yeti up uh, that that is available for things like that. What what do you use for your microphone right now? So I had my Blue Yeti, and then the little thing broke, and my son mm -hmm. just fixed it, but I haven't gotten it back. I'm using my Snowball, <laughs> and I'm lifting it up because I'm on my standing desk, and my desk's lower, so it. I think the sound is less. So I just bring it up. Yeah. Hmm. There Interesting stuff to dive into, <laughs> in, into the, uh, into the podcasting world, like, uh, inspiration and, and all, all included into, to how Stefana becomes a, a podcaster, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of people would be interested, especially when they're looking at that level four elective and they're like, what do you mean make podcast? Mm, I always so want to, fun. yeah, I always finish my, uh, I always finish my interviews off with a couple of very specific prepared points. Um, I have a question that was provided to me from a previous guest. And I think you could speak to this really well. It was a time that I wanted to play the video for it. But actually, I think it's better if I, if I read it back. Now, this, this question was given to me in my very first interview that's on the Leela Sieber uh, episode, which came out in August. She's the co-editor and producer of the District 7 Voices magazine. And her question, I think, seems really relevant considering what we've talked about already, is how do you protect yourself about... How how do you set your boundaries for doing too much or burning out or saying yes too much or no? At, at what point I'm not reading it, I'm not reading her question, but that's the the gist of the question is how do you set those boundaries? 
for I controlled space. I understand that, space. yes. Well, first of all, because of the nature of the work that I do as a holistic transformational coach and a practitioner in well-being, and when I say holistic, so I'm talking about the body, the mind, the spirit, boundaries is a very big topic and not just physical boundaries that yes, no, what are you going to say yes to? What are you going to say no to? But your emotional and your energetic boundaries, those are really important. And it goes back to fundamentally knowing yourself and giving yourself permission. And I'll say even more on that. You need to give yourself permission, yes, but also be your own best advocate. And that requires taking taking some inventory for yourself, personal inventory. I think a lot of people are on that spinning wheel and they need to step off. I think in the last three years, if we haven't realized what's really important, then that's probably something you might want to take a look at. And so to answer that, how do I keep my own boundaries? That's the first thing. I am crystal clear on who I am, what I'm here to do, who is important and most important in my life in terms of what I'm giving my energy to. And I do protect my energy and I have raised my boys in that way because of early childhood trauma. Uh, it took me a long time to heal from that and to work through and process what I needed to process. And the reason it took me so long is because I was living for others. And I think that's what happens when we say yes too many times. Yes to someone else's needs over our own. And quite frankly, it becomes a habit. And when that, you know, just like with any habit, how do you change a habit? Well, you implement something that should be. So make, make saying no to things that need to be said no to a habit and make saying a heck yes to the things that are absolutely what need to be a daily, sometimes moment to moment habit. Checking back into your body, taking a deep breath, focusing on one clear purpose. What is your one clear goal? Not 50 goals. We can't have 50 goals, right? We need to understand that. I think we've also been misguided in that we can do it all, have it all, be it all. And that's ridiculous. Why would you want to have it all, be it all, do it all? Why don't you do what you are here to do? Be all that you are here to be. And you will have everything you want, your heart's desire. I believe that firmly. I hope that answers her question. <laughs> I think it answers it wonderfully. And I think while I'm doing the edit on, on, on this recording, I'm going to have to play that answer back a couple of times because I would be lying if I said that I have that all under control all the time too. It's a work in progress. So we have to be easy with ourselves. We have to be loving and gentle with ourselves first and know that it is a constant process. My goodness, we don't tell the rose, come on, you got to open up and blossom now and, and wait a minute. And do we need to tape it back onto the, no, life is a cycle. Life is a natural ebb and a flow. And we need to allow these rhythms for ourselves or we will break down. We will die early on the vine. <laughs> well, this leads me to the last last two things on my on my list. And uh, I did ask you if you could prepare a question for my next guests. And I don't know which one is going to be the next. Actually, I do, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. They're a Toastmaster. What okay, would the great. question you'd be to ask to them? What brings you the greatest joy, either personally, professionally, or in Toastmasters? What brings you the greatest joy? That is an excellent question. And I think I'm, I'm going to play that one back a few times too. The final thing before we wrap up is I want you to, to 
uh, give an opportunity for you to promote the thing that you're working on right now that you want everybody else to know about. You mentioned a couple of things before in our in our discussion, but what would be the thing that the podium to the 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 promotion that you're working on right now? The Lead Stronger Longer podcast is something that is wonderful in terms of being able to invite folks and have interviews. So if there's if anything I've said resonates and you would be interested in being on my podcast, there's a very simple process. So you can go to stefanajohnson.com and find out more. And I would just, I would leave it at that, that I will invite anyone who feels, um, and I know Toastmasters are usually very outgoing and they want to do that. So, so I will just say, have you, you know, just check in with yourself. If I, I ask about early and early, I'll, I say it a mistake, but oftentimes those early mistakes, mistakes are catalysts for incredible growth. So if you're willing to share that early mistake or an early mistake that can give us, and then the story that goes with that about how it has helped you become a better leader for yourself, for your family, for your community, whatever that is, these are the kinds of stories that I look for in Lead Stronger Longer. And um, it's just an authentic conversation. So I'll, I will... That's what I would love to leave as a call to action. That's an amazing call to action. This has been a District 7 podcast. Stefana Johnson, thank you for being my guest today. This is episode, I'm not going to put an episode number to it, but uh, yeah, this is District 7 podcast. And I really look forward to seeing more of you in the future. Thank you very much, Stefan. My pleasure. Thanks so much. That was episode nine of the Toastmasters District 7 podcast. My name is Ray Miller. I was an interview and a conversation with Stefana Johnson, who is the past PR manager for District 7. We talked about youth leadership programs, reasons for joining Toastmasters, and a lot of other things. Now I'm going to move on to editing the next one. And I hope to see you again soon.